everybody, uh, wherever and whenever you're watching this, we would like to welcome you to Stony Plain Alliance Church. I'm Rob Davidson. I'm Linnea Nielsen. We are the SPAC Youth Grade 10 Boys and Girls Leaders, and today we're joined by some of our youth. Hi, I'm Gabs. Hello, I'm H. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, I'm Connor. Lene and myself have been journeying with these youth since they started in grade seven. Now they're in grade 10. We're going to be with them until they're in grade 12. Um, this current pandemic hasn't stopped us meeting as a youth group. Uh, every Wednesday we get together for an hour, we talk, we play a game, we watch a sermon from Pastor Matt, uh, and we discuss what we just heard. Um, and then we finish in prayer. Uh, it's not always easy, but we're just so ultimately thankful for the technology that allows us to still be in community with each other. So as we prepare to go into service, um, I ask that you uh, please put away any other devices that you have out um, that you're not watching this service on uh, and stay, instead just engage. Um, maybe stand to sing or, or get down on your knees, uh, whatever you feel called to do. Um, before we hear from Troy and Candace, let's bow our heads and listen to this short prayer called an invocation of the Holy Spirit. Most powerful Holy Spirit, come down upon us and subdue us. From heaven where the ordinary is made glorious and glory seems ordinary. Bathe us with the brilliance of your light like dew. Let us 
to experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory. and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord sing that one more time Holy Spirit and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. presence is with us. Holy Spirit, that you fill this place, our homes, as we come to you. Thank you that you are tangible. You're always with us. So we just invite you to come right now, Lord, and speak to us as we worship to you. sing our hearts out for you, Lord. Fill our homes, Lord, our hearts. Fullness of Fullness of eternal promise Stirring in your sons and daughters Earth revealing heaven's wonders Spirit come, Spirit come What you spoke What you spoke is now unfolding children shall be holding and dreams awaken in this moment spirit come spirit come pour it out and pour it out let your love run over here and now let your glory fill this house Let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. And now the world awaits your presence. And this power is within us. Yes, it is. And we will rise to be your witness. Spirit come, Spirit come, pour it out and pour it out. Let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. Pour it out. Let your love run over.
Let your glory fill this house Tongues of fire Testifying of the sun One desire Spirit come, spirit come Speak revival Prophesy like it is done One desire Spirit comes Sing that out, tongues of fire Tongues of fire Testifying of the sun One desire story. Sing it out. This is my story. This is my song. Amen. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Savior, all the 
So let us pray together now. Father God, we come before you and we thank you for this life that you have given us to live and for the blessed assurance that we have in Christ Jesus. Jesus, we praise you as Savior, the victorious risen King who ascended to highest heaven and sits at the right hand of God. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here today, now, we invite you to come more fully, to pour out upon our church and to pour out upon each person individually, wherever they're at, that they could grow into deeper and deeper intimacy with you as they spend time with you, that they would become more and more like you and that they would live out the mission that you have called them uh, to do the things that Jesus does. And so we trust you, God, to lead us forward. In your name, Jesus, amen. My name is Linda Stover, and I'm one of the pastors here at Stony Plain Alliance Church. Now, some of you might already be watching this in our online service that we're doing together, but for those of you who don't know about that, we're offering a new platform, an opportunity to watch the service together and to be able to comment and to share with one another via chat while the service is playing. We're doing this on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and you can access information about that in SPAC in 60 seconds, as well as on our website. Now, as we highlight the website, that is the place to go to for all information during this time. There's information about our online prayer that happens on Thursday evenings. There's information about child dedications, 
parents, if you're wanting to dedicate your children during this time, we as pastors want to be able to support that. And we look forward to talking to you about that. You can put your request in via the website under the children's ministry tab. And then we also uh, want to celebrate what the youth are participating in next week with Seniors Week and the Adopt a, uh, Adopt a Window program. And so you can find more information about that and sign up online. Now, as you know, we have a kids contest that's been going and there's two different contests that are going. There's the coloring contest. And just a reminder, parents, that you don't have to do the printed pages. Any way in which your child interacts with the message of the week, their own drawing, their own picture, a craft that they make that relates to that theme, you can submit that picture. And so for the coloring contest this week, we're going to choose the winner. And the winner is Jillian Fritz. So Jillian Fritz is going to receive a prize dropped off at her doorstep this week. The second contest is a combination and it's for families about both building family memories together as well as being good news to our community. And so we have the participants this week and the winner, making sure I get one piece, the winner is the Hildebrand family. And so congratulations to the Hildebrands. Now, as we've called people to engage in the neighborhood, in our communities uh, through this time, one of the things that we had highlighted was NeighborLink. And I wanna let you know that when I was talking to them this week, they mentioned that they had more volunteers and donations uh, after we had highlighted that with you, our people. And so way to go church in stepping up and engaging with our community. Now, you may or may not realize that Graham has been participating on the Mayor's Council during this time, and he's going to now be interviewing some key leaders in Stony Plain to let us know about other ways that we can be engaging in the community. So I'm here with uh, Councillor Justin Lurie, and uh, I've been working with him on a task force for social well-being in Stony Plain, and it's just been great to get to, uh, get to know you over Zoom. So welcome, um, and maybe uh, if you would just talk to us a little bit about the purpose of the task force. There's two streams to the task force. One's the economic stream and one's the social stream. And so the social stream in the task force was designed to look at all of the different aspects uh, that are impacted from COVID-19 in the social fabric and the social element of our, of our town, of our region. And so, you know, that includes some of the obvious ones, like those social supports that are required for things like food security and financial security and all those. But it's also just people being people. And, and knowing that, you know, we are social creatures, we're social beings, and, and we require that interaction. And, you know, as a town, we've always been so focused on our community and the community events and the different things that we do. One of the things that we really focus on is how can we bring those programs forward in a way that still allows the community to connect and to socially interact with each other and, and fulfill that need and, and desire that people have to, to be connected with people, to interact with each other and, and to come together in that way. So talk to us a little bit about what are some of the initiatives that the task force has done thus far? I think one of the great things that we identified early is our community partners and who we have out there already and the things that are already being done. And sometimes a lot of them are really behind the scenes and people don't know that those are there to realize how much of this is already being done in our community and just looking at the different ways we can support them. So that allowed us to, as you said, kind of narrow our focus and really start looking at, you know, some of the things, some of those gaps, some of the things that aren't being done or some of the things that were being done, but have been severely impacted in, in the way that they have. Happen. And so, you know, as you know, and, and as lots of people have seen, one of our first great initiative was the Signs of Hope campaign. And it was just working with our community to get that message out there to say, you know, even though we're apart, we can still be together. And then just other things as we continue to see, you know, potentially with the relaxation of some of the public health orders, what kind of things can we do to, you know, keep that social fabric of our community knit tight? What are some of the other things that we might be looking at long term? What we've come to realize is that there's likely going to be some significant long term lasting impacts from this. And, and some of the ways that we've maybe done things in the past may be changed 
potentially even forever, or, or at least at, at minimum in a long term. And so I think as, as we move forward with the task forces, as we, as, as we continue to look forward, it's going to be focusing on how do we help people adjust to that? How do we look at the situation? How do we look at those long term changes and those long term impacts? And, and how do we support our, our residents and, and the, the regional residents and our members in moving in that direction and helping them move to that direction. How do we make sure that, you know, particularly our vulnerable populations are, are well supported and well connected into those services? That's right. You, you made a great point that there are lots of great supports already available in our community. Uh, is, the, is there a place that someone can go, a website that someone could go to, to find out more? For sure. You know, obviously, when we look at community supports, FCSS is one of our biggest partners. And, and we always encourage everybody to reach out to FCSS, whether it's by phone, by website, by email, by Facebook, any of those resources, they're usually one of the best ones. Even though FCSS themselves might not put that program on, they're really the community connectors. They have their, they have their connections into every single organization that is in our community to support our community. And then the 211 phone number. You know, the, the 211 is a great service that our community subscribes to. It's uh, constantly updated as well. So that's a great thing. They have the most up-to-date, most current information. And any questions you have about any type of supports that you may need in the community, either FCSS or 211 are the best resources to reach out to to find those. All right. Well, awesome. Thanks for agreeing to do this. All right. Well, I'm here with Sherrod Chilag, and she's part of the Mayor's Task Force on Well-Being and also part of FCSS. So welcome, Sherida. We're glad you're here and it's been great to get to know you over the last little while as we've worked on the Mayor's Task Force together. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. So just real quickly, what is your role with FCSS? Um, with FCSS, I work as a community development officer working on different community development projects supporting um, different groups within the community, building capacity within the community, and addressing some of the social needs of our community members. Great. So, um, Councillor Laurie talked about the fact that one of the things that we would, would really like to um, encourage is uh, even deeper connectedness within our neighborhoods and see that as one of the best ways forward through this COVID crisis and beyond. And I know that FCSS is working on something called Neighborhood Connect. And uh, can you talk to us about what Neighborhood Connect is and what the vision is around that? The project really aims to connect neighbors to the valuable resources and supports that are right in their own neighborhood. Um, so to help improve the vitality and connections of communities. We, we found that if every one of us was able to reach out and to have a conversation or a connection with three to five neighbors, then as a community, we could guarantee that everyone is connected during this time of community stress. We talk about um, at our church that, uh, you know, Jesus talked about the fact that we're supposed to love God and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so being a good neighbor is just part of what it means to be a person of faith. And it seems like such a simple thing to say, you know, just be nice to your neighbors, but it's the value of that, especially during a time of crisis, cannot be um, overemphasized. Absolutely. So, so what kind of people would you be looking for when you think in terms of a neighborhood connect? And it's really everyone, anyone. Um, connector is just someone who commits to getting to know their neighbors. And you just have to have that passion to want to connect with the person, the people around you in your community. Um, so it's just strengthening those natural networks and supports that are within the community. So when you think of uh, caring for your neighbors, how many people would you be caring for? I would think you would aim to have 20 people, hmm. um, a block. Um, it's kind of creating that block connector and then each of the block connectors can form a, a larger group and, and, and have the community connectors. But, you know, if we could get everyone just to reach out to three to five, I think during this time, everyone would, would be able to um, be connected in that way. Okay, so um, how do people get involved as neighbor connectors, neighborhood connectors? Well, first of all, Pastor Graham, um, you're the, you would be a good person for your, for your congregants to reach out and ask more information about it and get direction on the project. Um, but there's lots of, lots of information on the FCSS website. On, on the connecting page, you can read all about the Neighborhood Connect project as well as some of our other projects. And you can always just give us a call and we could 
we'd be more than happy to explain the project and how you become engaged with the project. Perfect. Well, I have appreciated getting to know you as part of our uh, task force. It's been a pleasure to work with FCSS. You well. guys do a phenomenal job in Stony Plain. So just let me throw that out there to you and all of those who are going to be listening to this interview. FCSS is, I think you guys are rock stars. It is so great to hear from the leaders in our community. Now, some of you might be wondering, how, how can I be a good neighbor? I'm a little nervous about that. I'm not quite sure that uh, I know what it would take to do that. So what I am offering is just a four week course through June that will be about the art of neighboring. This is a book that really deeply impacted me. I do not consider that I am really strong in this area. If anything, I'm really weak in reaching out to my neighbors. But Jesus challenges me that this is what he's called me to do, that I am to love others and I am to love my neighbors. And so I want to offer a space for us to learn together. Right now, media has put together four short videos, so we'll be able to watch those and to dialogue about them we'll have the opportunity to pray together, to brainstorm ideas together, to go into the scriptures and see what it is that Jesus is really asking us about, and then to hold one another accountable to actually following through on those actions. Now, I want to invite all of us as church uh, people and people who are enjoying this service to continue to contribute and to give online. Uh, there is more information on the website and you can click the Give tab there. Well, we are in a series called What on Earth is Jesus Doing? And we're looking at the work of Jesus through the Ascension and Pentecost. And what we saw through the Ascension was that um, Jesus uh, ascended to the right hand of God the Father and really ascended to a place of ultimate authority where he now reigns over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And um, we also looked at the fact that because we're in Christ, we're now given authority because of our position in Christ and so the ascension is really about authority. Pentecost is all about power. It's one thing to have authority. It's another thing to have the power to be able to exercise that authority. And so uh, Pentecost is really about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and um, Jesus giving his power to his disciples. And so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says to his disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait. Go and wait for the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want them to run into a prayer meeting or <laughs> sorry, he does want them to run into prayer. He doesn't want them yeah. to run into doing anything. He doesn't want them to start a, st a Bible study or, or caring, for some, for caring for the poor even. He says, go and pray and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come on you. So Clark and Debbie are going to read from Acts chapter 1, 8 and Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Hear the word of the Lord. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Clark and Debbie. The, the power of the Spirit is just so intense there, isn't he? The 3,000 people are cut to the heart. The church is born. Man, the Holy Spirit is all about the presence of God that relates to the power in our lives. Jesus says, you shall receive power in Acts 1.8. And it's like, you talked about last week with your phone and not realizing the actualized power. Here now, the power of the ascended life is poured out. And Graham, my question for you is, uh, does the Spirit just show up here at Pentecost? Like, is this a whole new thing God's doing or what's going on? Well, it isn't, obviously, because in uh, Genesis chapter 1, it talks about the fact that the Spirit of God is hovering over the water. So when God performs that powerful act of creation... Um, God's spirit is present and active and involved in creation. And in the Old Testament, whenever God wanted to accomplish some 
thing through someone, a uh, prophet, a priest, or a king. That there's the odd um, artisan here and there that's referred to in the Old Testament. But the, the Holy Spirit anoints those people for the work that God wants them to do. Uh, there is a time, though, that the prophet Joel predicts where the Spirit of God would, would fall on everyone, would uh, fill every person. Mm -hmm. And so um, Adam Hurd is going to read Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29 for us. After this, I will give my spirit freely to all kinds of people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. At that time, I will give my spirit even to servants, both men and women. Thanks, Adam. Joel, Joel is saying that uh, the same spirit that empowered those who were prophets, priests, and kings would be available mm -hmm. to all people, would empower all people. There's going to be this day where the Spirit of God, so this is what Joel is looking forward to, pointing forward to. And so when the disciples heard that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit, they understood that the powerful Spirit present at creation, involved in creation, the, the Spirit that filled prophets, priests, and kings would be this, the, the fulfillment of this promise mm -hmm. that Joel made. And uh, they realized that the same Spirit that empowered Jesus and empowered these prophets and priests and kings would actually empower them and fill them. So it's not something new, but it's a new pouring out for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So then um, there's this beautiful thing here where we see in the New Testament where this actually is happening. Like uh, there's the story of Peter and before Peter's filled with the spirit, what we see in him is that he acts brashly. He's speaking without realizing what he's saying. He's acting in violence. He's calling down curses. He's denying knowing Jesus. But at Pentecost, in the giving of the Spirit, his life is transformed. Hmm. He speaks to thousands without even thinking about it, even an antagonistic crowd. He's talking to the Sanhedrin in boldness, and this boldness we read in Acts 4.31 comes through the filling of the Spirit. Not only is he able to speak boldly, he's also able to work in signs and wonders. He's able to heal the sick through the Spirit, uh, the lame, those afflicted by demons. He has special hmm. knowledge. He raises the dead. And these supernatural acts are exactly what Jesus did. Because just like Jesus is a uh, spirit-anointed person, mm. now so is Peter. And his life is just so different. You know, no longer is he fighting Jesus being arrested. He's now being arrested willingly. He's being chained to, the, to uh, prison guards. And uh, even the way he dies, you can totally see the work of the Spirit mm. in him. No longer is he running away. He's going willingly to be crucified, but refusing to be crucified in the same way Jesus did. He's crucified upside down, church history tells us. And then there's John. And John calls down, you know, or wants, I should say, to call down fire on the Samaritans, on his enemies. And he's jockeying for position and Jesus' disciples, and he's using his mom, of all people, hmm. to try and get position. But then once John's filled with the Spirit, we see his life change hmm. too. And now John is uh, just known by love, and even his core message is now mm. one of self-sacrificial love, and it's yeah. beautiful to see the work of the Spirit in these guys' lives. Totally. Yeah, and I, you know, on a personal level, I, I came to faith in Christ when I was 19, didn't grow up in a Christian home, and then by the time I was 24, though, I realized that there was something uh, significant missing in my own life in the sense that um, I, I knew about Jesus, and I had begun a relationship with Jesus, but really realized I was lacking power in my life, and mm. Uh, I was at the point where I was ready to give up because I thought if this is all that there is, then it's really not worth it. Um, it's a lot of effort, uh, but I'm not really seeing a lot of fruit in my life. And um, one night when I started reading the book of Acts and saw the work of the Holy Spirit and read some other Christian authors and realized that what was lacking was the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's not that he wasn't residing in me, but just not filling me, animating me. And mm -hmm. uh, one night, Wendy and I knelt down on our living room floor and we invited the Holy Spirit to fill us. That was really the first time that, that we said that prayer. And we, that's a prayer that we've said many, many times over and over again since then, probably a daily prayer that I pray. But I realized that I, I needed to have the infilling of the Holy Spirit in my life. And it made all the difference. Uh, that There was that crisis moment, but there really has been a, a progressive experience with the Holy Spirit over this time where um, God has done something miraculous in my life through his work. Yeah, yeah that crisis experience. I mean, that's, that's alliance lingo for the work of the Spirit in us, and it's core to even who we are as Alliance people, mm. the work of the Spirit. You know, the founder of the Alliance, A.B. Simpson, he had some serious health problems to the point where he was having these debilitating panic attacks, and they were so bad he was told by his doctor that he'd have to take a leave from his church because he did not have the constitutional strength to last more than a few months. 
And so it was during this leave he went to Maine. And uh, on this trip, he got so convinced, so convinced by reading the scriptures that, that Christ could mm-hmm. heal him through the Spirit. And so he prayed and he asked for healing. And this is how he describes what happens next. He says, I arose. It had only been a few moments, but I know that something was done. Every fiber of my soul was tingling with a sense of God's presence. On that day, Simpson was healed. And, uh, and he was not only healed um, of sickness, but he was also healed of not believing that God could heal. Mm. And healing became a central core belief, uh, a distinctive of the alliance. And then also with that is this also this understanding of going deep with the Spirit, like you talked about. Mm. That if the Spirit's like a river, that you can, you can be there in your toes and you can experience some, but we want the deeper life in the Alliance. Yeah. And so we want to dive in deeper and deeper. And, mm. and this is something that's even marking us in a renewed way over the last decade. And uh, it's really exciting, isn't yeah, it? It is. So today we're going to be talking about the power of the Holy Spirit for us uh, to be with Jesus, mm. to do what, or to be like Jesus and to do what Jesus does. And so Graham, what role does the Holy Spirit play in our lives today? For most, of, for most of us, there, there's a gap between um, what we know and what we experience. Mm-hmm. We, we always know more than what we experience for the most part. And um, the Holy Spirit really is the one that, that gives us an inner experience of God. We, we try to you know, do things like go to worship services, read our Bible. Those are all of external activities. But the Holy Spirit really is the one that, that provides the direct access for God to our lives. Jesus talks about this paraclete that would come. There's no real sufficient English word that describes the paraclete, paraclete but Jesus says, and, and I will ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate. Some translations use the word comforter mm-hmm. to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And then he goes on to say, my father will love them and he will come to them and make our home with them. Yeah, you know that idea of the paraclete, it's really interesting one. I'm, I'm just learning more and more about it lately. Uh, even in our youth alpha over the last month, I discovered this idea of the paraclete being the one who comes alongside. Now, that'd be a clunky phrase to put in the middle of the scripture, but the idea is uh, in the Mediterranean Sea where there's a storm and a small boat's having a hard time making it to shore, they'd send a larger boat to help draw it mm-hmm. in. And that larger boat was called the paraclete, and it was one that could come alongside to bring to safe harbor. Mm. And it's interesting because that's how the the spirit functions in our lives, doesn't it? He he helps us and he comes alongside us to bring us to Jesus. Exactly. And God is really unfamiliar territory for us. I mean, we we sort of know how to have a relationship with one another. Uh, We even make a mess of human relationships, but we really don't know how to have a relationship with God. And uh, so God takes the initiative. God pours his spirit into our lives and initiates a relationship with us. He makes his his home in us. Mm. And uh, he, he helps us to become familiar with him. And uh, Paul writes in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so the Holy Spirit really helps us to understand God as Father. Uh, it means that he leads us out from under condemnation, uh, out from under sin, or out from under uh, guilt and shame. Uh, he leads us into freedom. He leads us into confidence, knowing that God won't turn us away. Um, You know, if we hear that whisper in our hearts that we're not loved, we're not worthy, we're not accepted by God, that's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convinces us that we're loved and accepted and made worthy and welcomed. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 16, that well-known verse that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are indeed children of God. And then he he also writes that the Spirit of God cries out from deep within us, Abba, Father. I I just love that picture of the Holy Spirit crying Mm -hmm. out, Abba, Father. Letting us know really that we're God's children and in a sense changing our identity from estranged children of God to loved, wanted, and accepted children of God. And so if we're living in fear, we're not really experiencing the fullness of God, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When we're full of the Holy Spirit, everything within the depths of our being cries out, Abba, Father, as the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. We know that we're God's children when the Holy Spirit fills us. Cool. Yeah, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit relates to our spiritual disciplines even. You know, spiritual disciplines are these habits or practices that we do to attune ourselves to the presence of Christ and, and even bring ourselves as much as we can to the presence of Christ. There are things like prayer, scripture reading, confession, generosity, and, and so on. But there's something about the spiritual disciplines that is completely transformed when the Spirit's in them. That without the Spirit, you know, we, could, we can pray, we can read the scriptures, but 
it's not the same power. It'd be like me going to a kickboxing studio all by myself, mm. turning on the lights, mm. seeing a punching bag. I know you're picturing this already. Yeah. Seeing the punching bag and, and kicking at it, trying to do roundhouses and just you know falling apart of the seams. Yeah. More, more likely falling over and breathing heavy. But uh, what happens if I were to take that kickboxing class with a coach? Yeah. And uh, over months and months of, of this coach training me and her showing me mm. how to do this properly and, and training and practicing, mm. I'll eventually start to get some of this stuff done. It's because I have someone who's coming alongside me and helping me through this. Right. In the same way, because the Spirit's our paraclete, the one who comes alongside, he helps us. He actually is the power behind our spiritual disciplines mm. and, and makes them really work. Mm. Uh, brings us in the presence of God. I, I really love the way Eugene Peterson puts in 1 John 3, 23 and 24, the message. He writes, again, this is God's command, to believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. He told us to love each other in line with his original command. And as we keep his commands, we live deeply and surely in him, and he lives in us. And this is how we experience his deep and abiding presence in us, by the spirit he gave us. And so as we do these practices, as we do what he commands us, you know, the spirit comes and helps us to abide in Christ. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, one of the things uh, that I discovered uh, came from Henri Nouwen, who writes about spiritual disciplines, and he talks about listening prayer. Oftentimes when we think of prayer, we think of this long laundry list of things that we want God to do for us. Um, and it was sort of revolutionary for me to think that if I could just sit and listen, that God would actually speak to us. Yeah. And uh, he said that, you know, primarily what the Spirit will say to you is you're the beloved. You, because that's what the Spirit does. He convinces us that we're loved, wanted children of God. And there are all these negative voices in the world that tell us that we're not worthy and that we, you know, we don't measure up and, and that we're not loved and accepted by God. Mm -hmm. um, but the voice of the Spirit really does speak to us. And if we were to just, he says, if we were to just sit there and listen, it might take one day, it might take 10 days, it might take 20 days to actually hear the voice of God. Um, but it would all be worth it if we were to hear you are the beloved. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have, that's one of the things that I've been practicing in my life, not so much doing in prayer, although I do pray, I have lists of people that I pray mm -hmm. for, not so much doing in prayer, but really taking that posture of listening first to the voice of God's spirit. So Matt, talk to us about what role the spirit plays in helping us to become like Jesus. Okay. Well, great. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like when we think about becoming like Jesus, we're really talking about spiritual formation or character transformation. And uh, from a, a secular worldview, there's really two ways that we kind of look at um, character transformation. The first one is fatalistic. It's that I am what I am. I was born this way and I'm not going to change. You know, Jack Kerouac, the author, describes it as my fault, my failure is not the passions I have, but my lack of control over them. And it just feels like you can't win, you know. And then the second one comes all the way back from the ancient Greek philosophers, the Stoics, and potentially even before them. Uh, and it's just about trying harder, about making it happen, willing it forward. You know, it's what happens in our self-help section of the, of the library or the bookstore or the podcast. It's this idea, if I get the right idea, or if I just have the right habit, it'll guarantee transformation. Now, I don't know about you. I, I mean, it's been a while since I was at Chapters, but that self-help section is huge. Yeah. And it seems like there's no magic bullet. It mm. seems like you know, giving up or trying harder don't work. So there's got to be another way. And of course, there is, because with Jesus, there's always hope. Mm. And that's the power of, by the power of the Spirit, we can be transformed. And Galatians 5, I think, really talks about this with the fruit of the Spirit. It talks about how there's two different ways that we can be led. Uh, one is the flesh, like we talked about last week, the part of us that's been broken by sin, the part of us that... Um, is living kind of in rebellion to, against God and choosing our own desires in our own ways. And so we can be led by that or we can be led by the Spirit. And one will bring us to darkness, but the Spirit will bring us to right. light, right? And so what do you think about that whole idea of being led by the Spirit? What does that look like? Well, Romans, Romans 8 speaks to that. And um, Romans talks about the fact that those who are led by the Spirit are indeed sons and daughters of God, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we typically think of being led by the Spirit as you know, being led to, by the Spirit to make daily decisions. What should I do? Who should I marry? Where should I go to school? Those types of decisions. Mm -hmm. And sure, God does lead us in that way. But when yeah. Romans 8 talks about being led by the Spirit, it talks about the, the ability of the Spirit to lead us out from under the power of sin and death, to lead us out from under the power of sin. So most of us would recognize that we struggle with sin. Mm 
mm-hmm. there, there's a struggle. But when we live in the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit, we actually can learn to live in power over sin so that it doesn't pow- overpower us or dominate mm-hmm. us anymore. We no longer have to follow the path of sin. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we're able to live in the power of the Spirit and come out from under the power of sin to become more and more like Christ. Yeah, because, I mean, that's what the fruit of the Spirit's really all about is being like Christ, like love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all descriptions of Christ. That as we spend more and more time with the Spirit, he changes us to be like Christ, right? Like, lots of Christians, though, have this stoic approach that it's all about trying harder, that that if I read my Bible and pray every day, then I'm going to be completely changed because I've put the work in. But what ends up happening is months go by and there's not always that transformation or maybe even sometimes Mm. days go by and there's no transformation so we give up but the good news here is the stoic way isn't the jesus way instead the jesus way is about putting ourselves in the pathway of the spirit by being engaging in spiritual disciplines and then he does that transformation in us it's like how all of us are gardeners these days i i I know you're not gardening yet you'll get there covid could stretch out long enough that you might want to garden by the end of this but I know I've got my garden, giving another shot, and the, the thing I know about gardening is I can have the right seeds, the right soil, I can fertilize with the right fertilizer, I can weed, I can trim, whatever. But I can't, guarantee, can't guarantee the sun, I can't guarantee the rain, I can't guarantee there'll be no hail or frost. I can't even guarantee my seeds will germinate because that's really out of my hands. And that's really up to, to God, the ancients thought, and our transformation is the exact same way the spiritual disciplines we engage in, um, the things we do to, to practice the Jesus way, they're good for fertilizing the soil of our souls, but they don't guarantee transformation. Mm. Instead, yeah. the transformation comes through the power of the Spirit, mm. that it's His fruit growing in us as we're open and available to Him. But it takes time. Mm. I mean, my apple tree is going to get some, some apples, hopefully on it soon, but I can't just go at first sight and see them and go and eat them. Instead, they've got to have time to, to grow and it's the same thing for us. We have to be patient with spiritual formation and trust the spirits at work. But the hard part is we live in this instant gratification culture that's used to microwaving things. It's used to getting next day delivery on Amazon. It's used to fact checking whatever we want on our phones. And as a result, having to wait is even harder than it's ever been, I think. Yeah. But if we want to actually engage in this way with Jesus, that long obedience in the same direction that Eugene Peterson talked about, then we're going to have to be patient because the spirit doesn't work in instant gratification. Yeah, I love that picture of uh, partnership, really. It's mm-hmm. not like we don't do anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, we certainly do through spiritual disciplines, uh, but then the work of God's spirit to you know, animate us and empower us mm-hmm. uh, as we discipline ourselves. Yeah, totally. It's a great picture, yeah. So Graham, what role does the Holy Spirit play in doing what Jesus does? So again, Luke takes great pains to show us that Jesus' whole life and ministry is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that Jesus is conceived by the Spirit. He's, uh, he's uh, anointed with the Spirit. He's filled with the Spirit. He lives in the Spirit's mm-hmm. power. He teaches by the Spirit. Everything he does is done in the power and fullness of the Holy Spirit. And um, so in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus tells the disciples that the Spirit of God would come on them. It's the same Spirit that has been empowering Christ all along that would empower them. And we need to remember that Jesus was fully human Mm -hmm. and he was a Spirit-anointed human. He was filled with the Spirit and what he did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. He even said that he would minister in the power of the Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. And so uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21 Um, Jesus reads a well-known messianic passage in which he describes this and he would he describes what he would do and uh, David and Shara Ray Jansen are going to be reading that for us this morning we are reading Luke 4 verses 16 to 21 he went up to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him unrolling it he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. 
So Jesus, after he completes this, rolls up the scroll and he says, uh, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing today. And, and what he's saying is this, this scripture is about, is about me. I'm the one that came mm -hmm. to fulfill this text. This is my job description. This is my calling. And so if you read through Luke, you'll realize that, that Jesus then releases his apprentices and empowers his apprentices to do his work. Mm -hmm. In Luke 9, he sends out 12 disciples. And then Luke 10, he sends out 72. And so um, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus was never meant to be the, earth, uh, the, the end of his earthly ministry. No. Um, we, we see in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where Jesus says you'll receive this dynamite-like power, not just, mm -hmm. uh, not just a little a surge of power, but a, an explosion of power in mm -hmm. your life. And um, the work that, I'm, that I've started is now going to go forward through you apprentices. So here's the thing, that the work of Jesus has not ceased on earth, but now done through those who are empowered by, filled with the same Holy Spirit that filled and empowered Jesus. Well, that's all fine and good, but how do we do it? Good question. Um, I think when you read through Luke chapter 4 again, um, we proclaim the good news of Jesus to other, others. His job description becomes our just job description. Mm -hmm. The Spirit anointed Jesus to do what he said he was going to do in Luke 4, and it, he does the same thing for us. So we proclaim the good news of Jesus to others. Jesus came to proclaim the kingdom of God. He pro came to proclaim that the kingdom was available. The way of God is mm -hmm. open for you. And, uh, you know, oftentimes when you ask people what was Jesus' primary message, they'll say, well, God is love or forgiveness or grace or mercy. Those are all great ideas and they're all part of the gospel. But the main message that Jesus came to proclaim was the kingdom of heaven is here, right? Totally, yeah. We talk about that quite often. Uh, the way is open to God. We don't have to convince people to follow Jesus. We just actually get to proclaim Jesus. So just a, mm -hmm. a quick example, I was talking to a, a guy at the gym and we were having uh, lots of spiritual conversations. And at one point I just, I just said to him, hey man, the, the way to God is open for you. That's the message of Jesus. God is available for you. And uh, Jesus came to make the way for you to be reconciled to him and to have a relationship with him. And you don't have to do anything or be anything or earn anything or follow any <laughs> spiritual path. You don't have to be a religious person. All you have to do is just trust, follow Jesus by faith and you'll have access to God. Yeah. And it was kind of mind blowing for him, but he didn't stop and drop to his knees and invite Christ into his life right then and there. We still continue to have that conversation, but that's what proclaiming is, mm -hmm. it's just, Proclaiming, you're not convincing. Um, and then we demonstrate the good news of Jesus in, in practical kingdom ways. Jesus' ministry has a component of healing. And so, you know, he gives sight to the blind. And uh, the kingdom of God is where the sick find healing. Mm -hmm. And it's also where followers of Christ can go to those places that are broken in the world and begin to repair the, re repair the fabric of a broken world. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus' ministry has a component of freedom, of justice, setting captives free. Uh, how many people are, are trapped uh, by sin? How many people are trapped and enslaved in destructive patterns? Uh, so whole societies sometimes mm -hmm. are, are needing to find freedom uh, in Christ. So the gospel has the power to set people free. And wherever, whenever we involve ourselves with justice activity, uh, we're demonstrating the kingdom. And then Jesus' ministry has an element of provisions, good news for the poor. And Christians can demonstrate this by being involved in... Uh, those types of uh, ministries or ways mm -hmm. that meet the need of people who are on the margins or who don't have, who are poor. Um, places like Mustard Seed or Hope Mission, mm -hmm. the local food bank, NeighborLink, those yep. are all ways that um, Christians can be involved in bringing good news to the poor. But we have to do those two things together. We can't mm -hmm. just proclaim without demonstrating. We have to proclaim the gospel and we have to demonstrate the gospel. Those two things go hand in hand. It's kind of like uh, music and words that go together to create this wonderful song. Totally, and we're lost when we try to do one without the other, and we end up probably often doing more damage. Right. You know? So, uh, Graham, um, my question now then would be, how do we do this? Like, what's the next step? What do we do now? Well, I go back to what Jesus said to his disciples, wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Don't run out and do. Make sure that you are filled with power from on high. Mm -hmm. The command that Paul gives us in Ephesians 5, 18 is also instructive. Um, be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the awesome news is that 
uh, Jesus said our Heavenly Father loves to give the, the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And so if you feel dry, if you feel weary, if you have read your Bible but feel like your relationship with God is empty, you're not experiencing the reality of God, if your worship is distracted and cold, mm -hmm. if you are uh, lacking internal fruit of the Holy Spirit, if you lack confidence in sharing your faith and joining Jesus in his work, then you are a good candidate for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Your dryness and your discouragement perhaps is an invitation from the Holy Spirit to be filled. Uh, your emptiness, perhaps, is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Uh, when we become disillusioned, when we become empty, when uh, we become anemic, when we recognize that we're weak in and of ourselves um, without him, that, that's, I think, the perfect opportunity to be ready to pray this kind of prayer. Whatever it takes, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Help me to know your love more deeply. Produce your fruit in my life and grant me the boldness that I need to join you in doing your work. That is a prayer that you could pray every day and pray it in a genuine way. And I believe that Jesus is right. The Father loves to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And so all we have to do is ask. Yeah, it's like what Jesus says when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be filled. And, and Jesus longs to fill us. And so if you're feeling hungry, if you're feeling thirsty, if you feel like you need more of the Spirit, which I think describes all of us, Jesus' promises that we'll be filled and so what we're going to do now is we're going to lead uh, in a prayer. And uh, it's a congregational prayer, so it might be weird, but you can talk to your screen still. We're still here. And uh, we want to just lead you in a, a way of praying uh, for the filling of the Spirit. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to read part, and then after I read, Graham is going to read the congregational part, and the words will be up on the screen. So let's pray together. Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, at the beginning of time, you moved over the face of the waters. You breathed life into every living thing, being the breath of life. Come, Creator Spirit, and renew the whole creation. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, come. Holy Spirit, voice of the prophets, you inflame men and women with a passion for your truth, and through them you call your people to the ways of justice and compassion. Come, Spirit of righteousness, and burn in our hearts. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, by your power, Jesus came to bring good news to the poor and to release those held captive. Come, liberating Spirit, and free us from the powers of sin and death. Holy Spirit, Advocate, Teacher, you speak to us of our Lord and show us the depth of his love. Come, Spirit of truth, abide in us and lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, wind and flame, you filled disciples with joy and courage, empowering them to preach your word and to share your good news. Come, Spirit of power, make us bold witnesses of your redeeming love. Holy Spirit, Spirit of peace, you break down barriers of language, race, and culture and heal the, heal the divisions that separate us. Come, reconciling Spirit, and unite us all in the love of Christ. Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, at the close of the age, all the creation will be renewed in the singing of your praises. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Graham and Matt, for another great message today. So much to be thinking about. This phone number you can text with one of the following three responses. If you're new with us today, uh, you can text the word NEW so that we can follow up with you. Further information so that you could get our weekly emails and know more about what's happening in our church. You can text the word LIFE if you've chosen to step into this life with Jesus Christ, to accept him as Savior or to move closer to him in relationship. And the third, TRUST. If you're trusting Jesus through this difficult time, if there are stresses and difficulties that you're facing, but you choose to trust, we want to be praying with you, and you can text the word TRUST. Now, as we go to leave, let me just speak this blessing over you. May you be blessed with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, growing deeper and deeper in intimacy with Jesus as you spend more time with him, that you would become more and more like him as you're transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit, and that you would be empowered to do what Jesus does. So go in peace, my friends. <laughs>